uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll just say a couple of sentences about my background so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm a Belgian researcher. I, I'm here close to Leuven. Uh, I'm also connected to KU Leuven for a little uh, project. Uh, my background is in philosophy of education, and I did my research, my PhD research was on the question, how do we know on the basis of what do we know something is good for human progress or human development? So the question, what is good and what can we know is the, the, com, you know, the, the connection between the ethics, you know, the, the question about the good and how do we know that epistemology? So that is really my focus of my research. How do we connect ethics, the questions about the good life with the theory of knowledge that we, you know, how we know things. So after 10 years of academic research with that lens, you know, working on several topics, I then moved on to work for an NGO for or a couple of NGOs for about 20 years, mainly working with families in poverty and especially women in poverty, uh, coming from mostly, you know, both migrant backgrounds and, you know, generation poverty in Belgium. And we, we developed a research project with those, uh, with those women, with those groups of uh, people in poverty. So we did research projects about the complex problem of poverty and social exclusion, but not about the people in poverty, but with them. We treated them as the experts that could help us understand, you know, the, the researchers understand where they are coming from and where in our framing of the question we may have blind spots and that was the methodology that we de developed it's called transdisciplinary you know we, we we it's not just the disciplines but the people beyond the academic world that are included as experts the results were so um were so innovative and so impressive that we then got several uh, demands from uh, uh, policy makers to do research on uh, co-creating uh, social services with people in poverty. Um, we did research on how the research and innovation system itself could improve so as to tackle or could change so it, it would also be able to tackle these complex challenges just as, uh, such as uh, poverty. And then from there I moved on into RRI project, Responsible Research and Innovation Project. I did, I was a, a, um, a coordinator of a big a project on RRI, FOTRIS, fostering the transition towards RRI projects. And currently I am still in the advisory board of several other RRI projects. So I'm back in the academic world, but now, you know, I've learned most of all from those 20 years in the, in the NGO sector where we did, where we also did research and innovation, but in a very different way. And so my goal for today is to, we have, since we have two sessions, my goal for today is to help you understand what RRI really is about. You know, what is the philosophy behind it? What is the vision behind it? And once you understand, and we will work on different cases, you know, good examples and maybe not so good examples so that you can critically reflect what is really the key characteristic of RRI and how does it translate in some recognizable uh, parameters uh, but, you know, understanding that at, at, in your own words, from your own perspective. And then tomorrow, so, uh, you know, today is, is mainly going to be, do, I, do we understand it? Do we really understand what, at the, it's not just, you know, applying some criteria, but without understanding the philosophy behind it, but really understanding what it, what it is about. And then the next session tomorrow, I will let you work more than I will work. You, we will then look how you can apply those insights that I, we will hopefully win today to your project uh, and especially then in how you can use those principles uh, when you test your, your, um, your strategies, your ties. Okay, so that is the goal for today. So if today you already have all sorts of insights or ideas like, oh, in our co uh, project, could it be this or could it be that, please, write them down you know i hope you all have some paper or some notepads that you can take your you know uh, put your put your ideas your insights your aha moments your your critical moments <laughs> yeah thank you very much Motaz. and so tomorrow we can you know you can uh, we can we can then use those insights to to reflect together especially you because you know the project much better than i 
you can reflect on okay how are we in line with rri or what should we do different to be more in line with rri and i will be there as your resource person is that okay with everybody okay so my strategy is uh, always you know i trust that um a lot of the wisdom is 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 in the group you you're all researchers you all feel you know you all know things that are going well in research and things that are more difficult in re in research so i will use you and this group as the collective brain okay i will just trigger you with a couple of questions and then we will discuss together and if i say collective intelligence that also means that there is not what one right answer that i happen to know and you have to guess it it means that by putting all our ideas together we will get a very rich understanding of what rri is so i really encourage you to really speak from your perspective you know i'm i'm a belgian woman i have you know i have some research experience with, with people from different backgrounds in belgium but i know i have a lot of blind spots so my vision of rri might still be you know can still grow and get richer so i really encourage you to to take the floor and uh you know, ask your uh, voice, your opinion. Um, okay, that's for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm first going to tell you a little bit of where the concept of RRI came from, why it was invented, why all of a sudden this new phenomenon emerges in the landscape of research and innovation. And in fact, it's a, uh, it has a quite a bit of background. It, it goes back to framework program six and seven already, when there was a growing um, frustration i think uh, partly in the european commission uh, because you know there was a lot of euro skepticism you know people were not really trusting uh, authority figures anymore there was a lot of you know uh unhappiness and there was also a lot of you know people didn't trust uh, scientists anymore and you know they would turn to like social media to find find their own answers or you know populist approaches and uh you know fake truths and, and stuff like that so there was a there was this concern uh of the of many people that the link the the connection between uh, science and society had to be re-established so there was also a lot of um uh specific reasons why the public turned away from research and innovation for example there was a lot of uh, social protest against research into genetically manipulated uh, food or uh, exploitation and experimentation with animals because it was felt that it was you know not in line with values that people you know hold dear you know in the name of science we treat other living beings uh, you know like like dead matter so there was a lot of protest against that uh, a lot of the time you could also see that you know there was a lot of public funds go to research and innovation there's a huge budget but the results of that are not always coming back to the community that invests the money you know it, it society puts the money available but then very often the results are privatized you know they are they are uh, protected by intellectual property and then society has to pay again to get access to have access to the to the research that they already funded in the first place so it was like you know this is this is theft you know we give you money to do research and then you take the results you don't give them back to us <laughs> you take them away and we have to pay again so that was another problem uh, also that you know a lot of of the public funded research was then all was then you know um increasing the profit of private companies so there was like a public money leaking into private pockets where a lot of societal problems were not addressed uh, by by research by the research and innovation system um, there was also a, a huge power struggle about who is included and excluded from from uh, from science um, you know if you look at the the, the hierarchy in academia you can see that at the student level, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, you know fem uh, female students, uh, women, and then the higher you go in the ranking, the the the, the scarcer the women are. So there is exclusion mechanisms going on, and uh, not only about you know in terms of men and women, or you know, but also in terms of of uh, other minority groups or other you know uh, diversity is you know academia is a very 
dominated by male, white, middle class, etc. So that was also questioned because you know people say, well, the research will mainly reflect your interests and your perspective on things and exclude the perspective of, of those other groups. So that also undermines the trust that people have in, in, in science. It's not felt like it, it really represents you know, everybody's truth or everybody's perspective on reality. And then, you know, that that then again also uh, raised questions on on the position of science as such in in society, in that sense that um, a lot of the time, or you know, uh, like the, the 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 basic assumption is that scientists can discover the truth; they they reveal the truth about uh, about the world. And then they can ask society or they can ask uh, political leaders to implement the, re the, the, the findings of the research that they found. And there is a, a lot of discussion like how can, how can scientists define or, or decide you know, what society should choose, how democratic is they, are they representative? You know? And moreover, you know, if what we know now is that the way the world evolves has a lot to do with the, the, the choices that humanity is making so is is that choice to be decided only by by scientists or should other actors also have a voice in that and um is it uh you know is it for society to implement does it really work like that i mean i don't see many politicians who say like okay we got here this <laughs> this research report and it, the, the recommendations are that we should do this and that okay now the ministers are going to implement what you know what the researchers say so it doesn't really uh, work like that so there was a, a big feeling that science was pursuing its own agenda you know the freedom of research the curiosity driven i'm a researcher and i would like to know if there's life on other planets Whereas the needs of society and, and the, the options that society was exploring, uh, you know, to, to make to create a better world, there was a big gap between that. So there was there were many reactions against that, um, you know, not just by the funding agencies, but also from citizens. You know, there's a, a huge movement of citizen science. You know, citizens that say, hey, we also we're also educated. We can also do research. They, you, you know the you know, the, the citizen science, the, the, the citizen science labs, you know, the, the urban labs or the time labs where people come together to investigate something. Uh, there's action research, you know, where people by doing something, uh, not in a laboratory, by doing it in real life, learn how, how you know, how things work. Uh, like, for example, after the 2008 crisis, when, uh, you know, the, the, the faculties of economics just continued to teach the, the same economic models that had just caused a huge crisis or led to a huge crisis it was the students that say hey you're not preparing us for the real world and so they they launched student movements like rethinking economics it's now a very widely spread and they they set up their own discussion groups and they they read you know alternative economic theories and stuff like that so there is a strong bottom-up uh, alternative movement, call it, you know, resilience movement, like if, if we're not happy with the regime of academia, we can just create our own niches where we do our own kind of research. You also have communities that say, well, we, we really need to tackle the big challenges uh, of today, you know, the, the big, uh, the world is, is really uh, in a bad state and, and academia does not see, you know, it, it's not that academia so like, now all work for the SDGs, like, no, we're curiosity driven and we will explore whatever we want to. So communities were saying, let's explore how we can contribute to a safer world, you know, the regenerative cities and economies. But you also have experts that are really engaged, like, for example, you know, it's not that it's just people bottom up that do something different and there comes a new knowledge. You know, you also run into difficult technical questions. For example, there's a whole movement of people who say, instead of all consuming, you know, individually and for instance everybody buying their own car let's maybe share cars or share houses or share tools or share all sorts of things and you run into a lot of you know legal problems like is that legal is that is it can we do that or we is that against some regulations about ownership and responsibility so there's a big movement of lawyers who say hey we want to support that we will put our expertise at the service of this you know totally innovative way of dealing with economic uh, questions 
There's also the knowledge commons, you know, instead of privatizing knowledge, it's just spread open. And Wikipedia is the best known example of that. You know, it's co-created, nobody's paid for that, nobody owns it. It's just a community that creates it, and it's known to be as high quality as the Encyclopedia Brita Britannica, you know, it's constantly updated, so it's very good, and it's open access, everybody can access it. Uh, and then and, you know we have the we have a lot of NGOs that uh, that develop local knowledge that say hey the, the knowledge and the wisdom that we have here is not recognized by academia but it's also very uh, it helps us to to find solutions locally and we want it to be recognized and then you see also a big decolonialist movement also picked up by by academics who support that um, so there is a lot of there is a lot of uh, um, you know against the criticism against uh, academia about you know for the gap of between academia and the real societal needs a lot of initiatives are coming up emerging you know alternatives but also european commission is aware of that you know european commission is really concerned about being close you know listening to the citizens and and being close to the citizens need so they also uh, reflected on how they could contribute to bridging the gap between science and society and so like in uh, framework pro program six, it was called science and society in fr framework program uh, seven, it was called science in society. And then in horizon 2020, they called it science with and for society. So you, you see in, you know, how the terminology evolves that the reflection is also, you know, progressing inside. It's not just science and society, it's science in society and then science with and for society. And then, you know, today, it, you know, that is called of like summarized in the concept of responsible research and innovation. It's research and innovation that responds to the needs of society and also takes responsibility for, you know, contributing to the, to the needs of society. So that is where uh, the concept sort of like how the concept came into being and of course it's an ongoing process you know we're now we're you know we're still a lot of rri research projects going on uh yeah i see why not with society that was like swaths it's called science with and for society uh, so that is that is already you know it's uh, progressing inside you know you know from they do first step and say it's not enough yet they do a second step it's not enough yet so it's moving on and then now we have that like synthesized in the concept of um of uh of uh, responsible research and innovation and of course uh you know i've told you all the, the whole background like what what is what is the difference between you know normal what we call normal research and and responsible research is a very difficult one because many scientists say like wait a minute are you suggestion suggesting that until now we were irresponsible and you know some people have told me literally that they refuse to accept the concept of rri because they refuse to admit that what they did so far was irresponsible okay which is understandable it's not that all the scientists were in their laboratory saying ha ha we're gonna you know we're now we're going to uh use the money of society to work against society it's not like that many scientists are really convinced that they contribute to a better world but nevertheless this gap this gap uh, came about and now they're like you know the concept of responsible research is inviting them to reflect on where did we go wrong where was our, our compass a little bit you know off the course of societal needs and values and how did we you know go our separate ways and how can we now rejoin so that is why the concept of rri is interpreted interpreted in, in many different ways uh, because it's a difficult one it's it's you know, both intellectually what do we really mean like you know who is responsible for what am i responsible for climate change you know am i if i if i develop something that some criminal uses in a different country to to kill people am i responsible for that so it is a very very difficult notion and so to make it more graspable, let's say, uh, there has been a proposal by the European Commission to, to translate it into, uh, into uh, different uh, parameters. And I'm gonna share my screen for a minute to show you what those are. Can you see it? 
Yes. Okay. So um, there are uh, key components called key components. Let me just move this to the left. So I see the, I see you and I see, you. Uh, and it's, it's called um, education. Uh, you know, I, I heard somebody, I saw somebody in the chat say, is it, does it mean science education? It's education, it's ethics, it's engagement, it's governance, it's gender, it's open access. And then, you know, these six components are believed, you know, like the overlap in the middle of the Venn diagram is supposed to be responsible research and innovation. But as you can imagine, you know, if uh, some scientists say, but what we did uh, was not irresponsible, you know, they will try to show that what, you know, they, they, they're also gender aware and they're also uh, educating young people in their model. So it is, it is really crucial to be critical when you see this is RRI and to understand, to understand what, what, you know, what is the, the core, um, the core, the core vision behind it and how you can translate that into those six uh, components. So, um, let me see. Um, I just just to give you one example, uh, and it, interestingly, I had a I had an, an RRI introduction introductory course for students in uh, in Madrid yesterday, mostly Chinese students, um, and so I told them the story of a, an RRI conference um, where uh, there was an uh, an astronomist, a woman uh, you know who's a, a professor in astronomy. And she was describing that her research was about um, finding life on other planets. And she was presented as an RRI expert. And she said, yes, uh, we, are, uh, we, are, well, we are research, what, what we are doing is RRI. And I can prove it because um, you know, we, we checked on the different parameters and for example, gender. Uh, we have checked the gender balances in our research institutions and there's ASA and NASA and you know all these big shot uh, ast astrology astronomy institutions and we know that in ASA there's three percent women and in NASA there's maybe four percent women you know women or in the minority but we checked and so we can tick the box that we have a gender report so we now you know we have um, fulfilled one of the criteria for responsible research and innovation. And then they said, um, are we um, engaged? Let's engage citizens. So they had a sociologist ask citizens in the street, what do you think is the most intriguing question concerning uh, astronomy? And many people said, who is there life on other planets? So this professor said, we are solving a big societal problem. Okay, is there life on other planets? Because th this is what the citizens really want to know. And ethics is usually like, no, we did not cheat with our data. We, you know, we are honest researchers. We're not manipulating the data. You know, we are, we're doing our research in a really good way, you know, and uh, different things like that. So this is how she explained that her research, which she had always done like before. I mean, she did not, you know, she was always an, 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 astronom an astronomist. And she did research before, but to show that it was uh, responsible, she checked the number of women, she checked that the citizens thought, you know, that was an interesting question, and a couple of other, she was ticking the boxes. So I asked the students yesterday, do you think this is RRI? This is really RRI? And uh, it, does it respond to the big societal needs? And it was interesting that some said, Yes, it's an interesting question, but we're not sure about the other parameters. And there was one group that said, they're not responding to the big societal problems, because even if we find life on other planets, we don't even know how to save life on this planet. So that is where the, the you know, responding the needs of, of society is responding the real needs and not just, you know, some oh, interesting question that some scientists might be playing with, but how will my children survive on this planet and sure we may hope that maybe in the far future some you know colony will be found where we can uh, you know move humanity to but if we have not learned to live within the, the limits of one planet how is it going to help us to survive on a different planet so i hope this this helps you to understand the difference between uh traditional uh, science, you know, by one discipline, one expert that, you know, just adds some additional criteria 
And then a different approach which says the, the, the societal need is central. And from there, we will redefine what the agenda of science should be. And then you will also have your six parameters, but it will not be enough to count the women and say, we did the women count. They're not, they're excluded, but oh well, we did the women count. Okay. So this is, you know, what I would call um, uh, the, the difference between a, a, a weak and a superficial approach to RRI and a more strong approach to RRI. And as you can probably understand, you know, I, I've worked with women in poverty. I wanted to tackle their real needs and their real needs are not to know if there's life on other planets, you know, for some researcher to explore. But, you know, how can we get out of poverty? How can we make sure our kids have a decent life here in this world? Okay. Um, Please switch to presentation mode PowerPoint. Oh, did I, did I, uh, oh, okay, yeah, you mean the, the, the full screen. I will do that later, yeah. I'm, I'm first gonna uh, sort of like um, let you do, um, let you do a little exercise to understand, you know, if we're gonna move, if we're saying it's not about doing science as usual and then adding some flags, you know, to make it look very posh and responsible, it's about really re repositioning um, the relationship between how science contribute to society, not just, you know, science does its own thing. And then afterwards, you know, uh, society can, can, you know, approve of or say it's okay with us, but really, you know, society comes first, the ethical question comes first, and then science has to re question itself. So this is what we're going to explore a little bit more in depth. Uh, in this session, you know, what does it mean? What is the difference between traditional uh, research uh, and a really, uh, when you, you know, the, 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 the knowledge uh, is first and then afterwards we justify it to society uh, by saying, yeah, we know we're, you know, we're excluding women, but okay, you know, we say, sorry, it's okay. And the other one is like, if we really want to tackle the complex problems of today, what will it mean for research? You know, how we define it, how we frame it, and then how does this translate into those different <clears throat> six parameters? So to give you a, a, a little exercise, because I, I'm sure you, you, will, you will come up with a lot of the answers, I would like you to reflect on um, a, a problem where uh, <clears throat> science and innovation uh, was contributing to uh, something that we would know, to human health, and I'm talking about the antibiotics problem. Uh, so antibiotics was uh, found in a laboratory by a, a scientist or a virologist or whatever, you know, a, a, a medical researcher uh, who was aiming to contribute to human health, which is certainly a very good uh, aim, you know. And so he goes in the laboratory and he looks at one dimension of the illness is the bacteria. And he says, OK, I have a solution for this. I have here an antibiotics that you know, with 95% certainty will kill uh, the bacteria. So if, uh, if it works, so I have this, you know, degree of success in my laboratory, what I assume is that, you know, you know, I have the truth here, I've discovered this truth that with this pill, we can kill 95% of the bacteria. So now my recommendation will be, if you implement this at large scale in society, roll it out at industrial levels, you will have much more health, you know, a linear thing, you know, if I can create health on a small scale in my laboratory by killing a disease, the more antibiotics we uh, apply, you know, the more health I will, uh, will be created in society. Now in 2000, was it 19, just before the COVID outbreak, the World Health Organization has declared antibiotics, the largest health issue, the largest health threat ever in human history, and it is a man-made health risk, okay? So how did that happen? You know, that is one play where you could say, how responsible was that? You know, how responsible that we scientists in that thought they were doing the good thing have created the biggest health risk ever in society. So now I would like you, I'm gonna give you the floor and reflect together like, what happened? How come a good invention, you know, 95% uh, successful, all of a sudden became one of the worst things ever? 
what elements play the role. So I don't know how we're going to uh, moderate the discussion. You raise your hand. I see some people with a camera and I can see you raise your hand, but you also have uh, the raise hand in your... Um, if you go to participants, can you raise hands there? Can you raise, is there a, raise your arm? Raniero, can you help me with this? I don't see that function. Okay, then, you know, maybe you'll have to unmute yourself or show your camera and, and show what, uh, show that you have an ID. So, I an idea. okay, first ID. And then, you know, it's, I, I, I will not respond to every ID. I want you to respond to each other's IDs. Okay. <coughs> so please unmute your camera so that we can start this the discussion. Okay, go ahead. You can see me and you can hear me. Is that right? Yes. I think I'm from Turkey and I think uh, according to I think the reports Turkey is one of the worst countries in terms of antibiotics consumption. So actually the key word here is in my opinion uh, reverse to responsible. I think we have been consuming antibiotics irresponsibly. They were so available and actually I mean, for example, the times I was living in the States, when you go to pharmacy, according to the, according to doctors or the clerk's uh, decision, they make a calculation. So actually uh, being a doctor was kind of a mathematic and statistics thing. So actually they were calculating the amount of the pills that you have to take. So the number of, I mean, the number was certain. So if you would take like six days in a row, certain amount of pills and that would be the case and maybe you will revisit the doctor or that would be the thing but in turkey go ahead please Anne. yeah just i just want you to explain why consuming too many antibiotics creates a health problem because it, the, the basic idea was if it creates health on a small scale the more pills we take the more health we will produce and you're saying no you have to take just enough. And if you take too much, then it's bad. Why is that? Well, because, I mean, it becomes the normal itself because we are taking antibiotics because they're extraordinary. They have extraordinary power. But the more we use them as in a regular way, we normalize their power. Okay. And so why actually, is that? The, the fighting power is just loosened. So it becomes the regular thing. So they cannot actually fight against the bacterias uh that's you know they're supposed to do so it becomes the regular thing in my opinion okay can somebody else respond to that thank you yeah actually um um can i yes andres yeah yeah i'm, I'm raising my hand in the participants list. unfortunately my camera is uh, is not working so i'd rather um, <laughs> we remember your face andres don't worry yes yeah um uh, i see your little hand <laughs> it's uh, well, I mean, what came to my mind is uh, that uh, um, that neither neither the kind of the the, the total of scientific knowledge nor actually hum, uh, human societies are static. So there's there's been a there's been a change. There's been a constant uh, uh, change. You can call it evolution. You can call it development. And it's not obvious that what is uh, what is canonized knowledge at a certain point remains so for over over decades or even even over centuries. So I think what what happened here that uh, based on the 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 availability of uh, of of knowledge or scientific knowledge, there was a claim made uh, uh, about the effect of antibiotics, and then I mean a valid question about responsible research whether I mean. That in that particular time, uh, the scientists who made that claim had all, uh, all all the available knowledge, and based on all the available knowledge, using all the um, um, uh, sort of approved and canonized scientific methodology, the claim what he or she made was valid. If that was so, then it's not his or her fault of responsibility. However, I think that's the that's the beauty of science and research that um, you know like standing on the shoulders of giants that uh, we constantly need to um uh, need to sort of uh, um uh, um iterate and mitigate and deliberate uh, the the results so once the science loses uh, its ref self reflection 
then that's a big responsibility issue. So I think the problem here is that is it is not reflecting on, 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 on itself any longer because it became an issue of the interest of big pharma, of corporations, of uh, economic uh, uh, groups. And so right now, I think selling more antibiotics is, uh, is, a, is a stronger interest than, than saving people's um, integrity and health. And that's, that, that, that has become an issue, but it's no longer a, a medical or, or, or chemistry issue. I think it's much more the issue of political science or sociology or, 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 or global development. Okay, very interesting. So from a medical laboratory, if we want to increase health, we're gonna have to move to political science, economic science, uh, sociology. Yeah. Very interesting. There you already see how, you know, from one discipline, one specialist say, I can tackle a big societal problem. You run into problems because you have overlooked, you know, the canonized knowledge did not include those, those variables that, you know, the pharma company drive. Very, very interesting. Anybody else want to react to that? This is really, wow. <laughs> Why, how come, you know, the, you know, big pharma and the habits of people, uh, you know, it became the norm and, and the canonized knowledge, you know, drove massive consumption of, of, um, of antibiotics. But one of the key questions still remains, why, how come that all of a sudden, instead of increasing our health, it undermined our health or it threatens our health? How did that happen? Okay, Alessandra. Good morning. Um, th thank you. Thank you for this uh, for triggering this uh, this debate. In my opinion, it's also about introducing the um, the psychological effect. Uh, you have a lot of experience in this, uh, you know, epistemological approach and uh, commun political communication. It's a, I think it works with antibiotics. It, it works like with any other drug basically so you develop resistance to antibiotic it's like uh, um, the same concept can be applied to any other drug from hashish and marijuana to cocaine to um, ibuprofen the more you use it the more you need it to to heal yourself or to to get high in other cases so um, then if we combine this aspect which is maybe a chemical base this is not my background so in terms of i need it more to heal then combine it also with the psychological effect. I don't. I generally don't use uh, drugs when I uh, when I have a um, headache. I try. I try to to resist, like psychologically. So if I take uh, even a small pill, a small tablet, uh, I convince myself that I've already taken one and it works. So I believe that this self healing process is also the psychological component of healing of uh, approaching our health is important. Plus, I know that my body is not used to, to taking drugs. So maybe it's more effective in itself from a chemical point of view. So um, I believe the both component, one is mostly chemical in terms of what I need. Um, it's about antibiotic resistance and maybe also the placebo effect in our mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for this. Uh, I'm I'm looking at the time, and I have another another couple of other discussions that I would like to have with you. So I'm gonna round it up here. But please feel free to continue afterwards. What is really interesting is that, uh, and I really like the idea. Like somebody said, uh, I think it was um, Andras said, it's not the fault of the individual researcher. It's more a systemic problem. You know, there's canonized knowledge. They're using the knowledge available at their time. Well, the knowledge available at their time is that, you know, you develop knowledge in a laboratory. You know, that is the paradigm. We split reality into different uh, parts and we specialize in one of the parts. Okay, I'm, I'm a specialist in economics. I'm not a specialist in chemistry. I'm a psychologist. I know nothing about uh you know biochemistry whatever so this is how normal science has been uh, developed uh and interestingly you know we come we, we we're now in a, in a period of climate change and a lot of the earth parameters are, are changing now but the past twelve thousand years if you look at the history you know we come from a, a long prehistory of uh ice ages and interglacial periods you know a lot of very fluctuating 
um, uh, climate patterns, you know, which also affect the plants and everything that grows. And then the last 12,000 years have been amazingly stable. You know, we had seasons, uh, you know, a little fluctuation, but no huge, no huge fluctuations. And this stability has allowed people to settle. You know, we could start doing, we did not have to migrate to where the climate was mild. We could settle and do agriculture. And from agriculture, we could, you know, make settlements and culture, et cetera, et cetera. So that also gave people and society, that was the last 12,000 years, the idea that reality is stable, that it can be expressed. You know, somebody said it's a, you know, the, 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 the fluctuation of reality. Uh, we, you know, nature has fooled us a little bit into believing that everything is stable, that the climate is stable and the soils and biodiversity. And so, you know, even in, in you, you can study these things separately and assume that all the other parameters remain the same. You know, in economics, they call that ceteris paribus or ceteris paribus. You know, we will change one parameter we assume that all the other parameters are, are the same. So if in my laboratory, I can manipulate A and see that the outcome is B, I will assume that if in reality, I do more of A, more of B will be the outcome, right? Because we think everything is stable. And now today, you know, we know that the climate is not stable anymore. You know, people are migrating massively, you know, all this, the, the, the course of the, the oceans is changing, you know, a lot of things are changing. So that is where the canonized science is not able to respond, you know, the canonized being, you know, I'm a specialist, highly specialist, and from my laboratory, I do predictions about impact on reality. You know, I tell society to implement what I found in my laboratory, that's where it goes wrong. And I think you have all, you know, you've listed up a lot of uh, factors that play a role in that, you know, when we, when we do massive uh, you know, use of, of, um, of uh, antibiotics, you know, some of the biophysicals of that, if you, in, if you say I can kill 95% of 95% uh, ch certainty chance that I kill, that I kill the, the bacteria. If you do that in a laboratory, you're very successful. Wow. You know, wow, that is really big chance that you're going to create health. But if you roll it out on an industrial scale, you're going to the next level of complexity. You're doing agriculture. You're doing, you're, you're, you're doing a breeding program in which only the 5% strongest bacteria are allowed to reproduce while the 95% weakest bacteria are eliminated, okay? So you're, you're, you're going to a next level of complexity that you have not seen in your laboratory. The laboratory is on the level of the individual bacteria. And you say, I eliminate it with 95% chance, which means only the 5% strongest might escape but if you do that in at industrial scales then you're doing a breeding program you know you create superbugs you allow only the strongest one to reproduce and our immune system you know the second the second part if we 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 take the we take all the we take all the you know that many uh, antibiotics of course when we go to the toilet you know it it leaves our body again and it comes in the groundwater meaning that already now babies get ingest little quantities of antibiotics so that weakens their that weakens their uh, their re their immune system you know our immune system is not ready to fight anymore so we are weakening human health and then why did we do, do all this you know why did we sell so much you know you you said that it becomes a habit we want a quick fix you know uh, we don't feel like we can have the time to to be uh, ill, we're, we're dependent on it. It, it, it becomes like a drug. Um, uh, and also, you know, the, the pharma, you know, the money system is behind it. Why does the pharma not say, hey, our aim is to create health, so therefore we should not sell too much? Why does the pharma not say that? If the pharma could say, hey, and it's a, our mission is to, to improve human health, so let's, re, let's not sell too much. Let's make sure that we don't sell too much, but all, only just enough. So that would be a next question. Why is the pharma doing that? Is it, the, is it the fault of the individual, you know, pharmacology uh, company, or is there again, you know, a systemic, uh, systemic mechanisms behind that? And so this is how you see how all these systems, you know, this tiny little problem really connects to other systems and they reinforce each other and they connect into bigger, you know, 
you know, groundwater is affected, immune systems are affected, bugs, mutations, you know, super bugs emerge, and all these things work together, and all of a sudden, poof, you have a new reality, a very, very weakened health system, okay? So responsible research and innovation means that you first say, what is the goal? What is the societal goal? Increasing health, okay, for example, and that then you say, what are the factors that can contribute to that and under what conditions can they contribute to that and then it could be well you know in some conditions you may need medication on the condition that you sell it just enough and not too much you know we also gave antibiotics to the to the cow to the, the cattle or to the you know the animals that we breed for food chickens and cows to prevent them from falling ill so massive 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 it's in the groundwater it's in the meat it's everywhere so because you know the farmers thought it was in their interest you know they're not they're not they were not intending to undermine human health but there's so many mechanisms that work together so to be responsible you first map all the different factors that contribute to that goal or that you know blocks stand in the way of that goal and only then can you define this part of you know i can contribute this part of the solution on condition that it works together well with the other pieces and it's not like you know, I'm a specialist and I will find a solution, you know, and now we do that. We all do that. It's the other way around. You know, it's not from having research first and then say, and this will be good for society. It's starting from the ethical question, what is good for society? And then asking what kind of knowledge can contribute to that. And you have shown very well that it has to do with psychology, with economy, with biophysics, etc. So that is where responsibility, we call RRI, we call it co-RRI, it's always co-created. The problems today are so complex that it is impossible to say that one discipline can solve them. You know, that is naive, that is irresponsible to say that, and the, the example of antibiotics shows it. So that's what I also want to say to the, to the, the you know, the, the astronomers, like you're, you're using a lot of uh, money to refer, find life on other planets, but how is it going to save the life on the planet? So this is, I think, um, I would like you to um, to really understand that uh, in this slide, you know, where RRI is in the center and then the six parameters are around it, what is in the center is really start from the ethical, you know, start from the societal goals. We want to respond to the societal needs. And from there, we will start unravel all the factors that contribute to that. And then we can do research in a responsible way. We will also know how far we can go and where, you know, we, where we have to be. Do we have to change the money system? You know, can we trust the money system to, to, uh, to spread our uh, research findings or to uh, valorize our careers or to, to spread the knowledge? Or should we, you know, also change the ownership models, make sure there's open science, etc. So this is a little bit uh, the core idea, and I hope that with the example of um, of uh, antibiotics, you, you've understood, you know, how complexity works and how you cannot from one, dis you know, one discipline can, can be a part of a solution, but it will all the only be a really responsible and sustainable solution if you, you also study the interactions and the, the feedbacks from other systems, the psychological ones, the sociological ones, the political ones, the economic ones, the biophysical ones, the groundwater, the you know, natural evolution, et cetera, and put all those pieces of the puzzle together. Then you may come up with a good solution. And then as somebody says, you know, because uh, societies are not static, nature is not static either. Nature is constantly evolving. The climate is changing, you know, bugs are, are uh, uh, even Corona is now, uh, Mute, you know, mutations are evolving. So you never, you can never uh, assume that you have found the truth and now we just have to implement it. You can have found a contribution that goes in the direction of the societal goal, but your solution is also has to be re-evaluated reflexively all the time. So you already came up yourself with, you know, what the core of RRI is. I was quite sure of that. So I trusted you. So. Do we need do we need a little break here? Do we need to sort of like have five minutes to stretch and get a glass of water? Maybe yes, maybe it's a good idea, yeah. yeah. Five minutes. Okay, thank you.
Do we have everybody back? I hope so. Anyway, you can start. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Louisa. <laughs> I see the thumbs up. Okay, well, uh, just to sort of like summarize, uh, the story that I've told you so far and that we've discussed so far is basically about you know the transition from what we call normal RRI or you know the canonized uh, canonized research and innovation to what is now called responsible research and innovation. The term responsible is sometimes a bit difficult because people don't like to be called irresponsible. You know the person who invented antibiotics would not be happy if, if you call him uh, irresponsible. But as somebody said, it's, our, it's the responsibility of research and innovation to be self-reflective, right? To, to question your own canonized practices and especially what is called anomalies. Do you, do you know the term anomaly? This is a, a concept from Thomas Kuhn, you know, where uh, normal science, the canonized science predicts certain outcomes and all of a sudden, you, you see that, you know, a phenomenon that was not predicted by your models. And that is called an anomaly. And you can say, oh, we need to improve our model to, to explain that away. Or you can say it shows that there's something wrong with the model. 
And so, you know, you could say that weak RRI is uh, not considering that as anomalies, but just the next challenge. Uh, uh, more progress, more scientific progress. We will beat the superbugs. The next antibiotics will beat the superbugs. Whereas responsible research and innovation will say, well, maybe there was something wrong with our assumptions about how we have to achieve human health, you know, by, by fighting bugs. Maybe it's more complex than that. So that is like the, the basic, uh, the basic, um, I think, uh, the, co the core, what is at the core of, of responsible research and innovation is that you start from this different vision of science responding to the needs of societies and responding to the anomalies you know the the things that that were climate change has is is one of the things that you know would not have happened without research and innovation we invented cars and we invented combustion engines and you know it took a lot of research and no nobody ever did that with the intention of changing the climate but here we are and now it's for us to to take uh, responsibility and so, because in the next, um, you know, in in the rest of the pro the project, the the aim of uh, of this of this uh, uh, workshop is that you are you feel capable to apply this concept of research and uh, of RRI to your own research project uh, and to your to your Thai strategies. Maybe I would like to propose now that we discuss a little bit among ourselves. I think the six parameters of RRI. Uh, I can share them again in a minute, are very helpful um, as long as you, as they don't take you away from the core, the core of RRI. The core is that we question, we are self-reflexive about how science relates to, you know, the complexity of society today and the needs of society today. And then, you know, we can see how that translates into governance, gender, etc. And not just, oh, we do what we've always done and we just, you know, we check the gender balance and then we say it's okay. So maybe um, I would like you to, I will uh, share again my screen um, of, the, of the first parameters, of the six parameters. And I'll maybe increase it a little bit. So hopefully it's more visible even. So now I share my screen. Share screen. Okay. Share. And then now I can also go to the PowerPoint and make it full screen. Is that clear? Can you see it? It's good? Yeah, okay. So, um, maybe, um, does anybody already want to, um, you know, if you, if you look at those, at, at those parameters, do you have an idea of what it could mean? Like, um, is gender just counting the women and uh, or would it mean could it mean something else something uh, if you if you really start from responding to societal needs what could what could uh, the gender dimension contribute to that or the ethics dimension do you already have, you know I, I just want you to to think if you already have ideas and otherwise i will give you a case and then that will make it maybe a little bit more concrete but please share what your first ideas are already Since I'm sharing my screen, I can't see so well the participants. So you have to speak up, unmute yourself and speak up. Okay, can I, can I say something about gender? Yes, please. Um, it's not so much about real research, but let's say what is called social innovation, okay? We had many problems. I've been, I've been working in the area of cooperation for development for, for some time. And there are many countries where uh, the rights of women are not recognized. The role of women is very much, uh, um, let's say, uh, in trouble and things like that. And we had examples of cases where uh, some initiatives to promote the rights of women uh, 
created actually many problems to the women involved. Mm -hmm. I give an example. I spoke to the president uh, of an Indian association of women. And what they did, they invited their women uh, to uh, meetings. Uh, there was not the corona at the time, so they could have uh, physical meetings uh, to, to try and uh, uh, increase their awareness uh, and their rights uh, and things like that. And what she said was that many of these women, when they went back home, they were uh, hurt by the husbands because they were this, this was considered as something, uh, a sort of revolution, like they were attacking them, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a very common uh, 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 example. Whenever you try to promote the right of like vulnerable group in a, con a context where these rights are denied, you might uh, create a situation where these people are threatened. Their, their, their let's say, even their, their safety, their personal, safety is uh, uh, is in trouble so okay. this, this, this is one one example of how whenever we write projects in this area we always have to in, uh, to take into account uh, the possible negative effects of the kind of social innovation that we try to bring in so th i okay. think this is it and it concern these concerns i would say gender it concerns ethics it concerns education and probably engagement. So it's four out of six of the dimensions that you have that you have uh, uh, identified for LRI. Well, I, I did not identify them. It's a, it's a commission that identified no, them. I mean, just to sure. detail, the person who launched the concept of innovation in the European Commission is René von Schomburg. Uh, he published a lot about it and he was quite unhappy with these six parameters. But because they are so commonly used also in European projects, I think it's useful to work with them, but in a very critical way. So that's why I wanted to have this discussion a little bit, because in one sense, you know, it's a useful tool on the condition that you that you use it correctly and wisely. OK, so, yes, th those are six parameters that are generally used, but it's very crucial to understand them correctly. It's not about counting women. It's about equal equal position between men and women. Is that right? Is that a, a good, you know, equal, you're talking about rights of women, equal rights, if they're in a... So what you would do, you know, if you would, um, would anybody like to, uh, Andras, would you like to respond to that or add something else? No, I would rather add something else. So just go ahead if there is anything more about the gender no, no, dimension. No, let's first let's first collect your ideas and then I can I can respond right. to all of them yeah. together. Um, so my 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 question or, or remark is is more about definitely about engagement and a little bit about uh, governance, and uh, the, the the question is related to the uh, to the public or to uh, to society, and um, and the dynamics between uh, you know society's interests and society's views and the preferences. And 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 between the, uh, the 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 interest of those who are responsible for governance and actually and 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 the issue and the question you started your presentation with uh, the question of common good. So I mean, defining what uh, what good is and what uh, what what is needed. And I think it's especially relevant in these days when uh, when populist political culture is uh, is so much um um successful uh, as. Uh, I'm not always convinced that uh, society and the community is the is uh, is the best judge uh, in order to deciding what uh, what is needed, and especially in in issues related to equal opportunities. For instance, you know, um, adequate policies of uh, of getting rid of ethnic minorities that can be a very very strongly um, expressed uh, societal interest, but I'm not sure if responsible research is something that uh, that uh, should serve this. Uh, uh, this idea. So, I mean, how, how, how would you, uh, you you mitigate this 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 tension? Excellent remark. Excellent remark. Who decides what is responsible? Anybody else? I cannot see all your hands raised, so please speak up. Alexandra has raised her hand. Go ahead, Alexandra. Yes. Thanks. 
Uh, thanks for uh, for uh, the for the previous remarks. Also, um, what I want to add is not about the, the gender in itself, but about the definition of target groups. And I think in the Rice project, uh, we paid. I mean, the project team pays a lot of attention to the vulnerability, uh, different indicators, etc. So when we consider the target groups or the beneficiaries of a project, of a research project, of an action, of a policy, whatever, uh, often Often the different indicators of the deep beneficiaries are not taken into consideration. So the gender, the gender component is now widely acknowledged. But when we consider different population trends from the aging population to migrant migration flows or social gaps in economic terms, then in the end, all these elements are not really kept into consideration when we implement uh, the research both during the data collection phase or uh, often when we talk about action research, it's about the final use of our results. So um, often we really don't consider all the dynamics. So we focus just on gender, but uh, also the age component is very important. If we keep talking about the aging population, for instance, or as I said before, migration trends or social gaps, we often don't uh, include these breakdowns in our uh, data collection and analysis. And also when we develop outputs, which are supposed to be, or the so-called you know, communication campaigns. Now in all projects, we have these communication campaigns aimed at reaching basically anyone, but we cannot really tailor, tailor them because we don't have maybe enough information on the people we want to reach. So maybe include more dimensions, not just the gender one, and really focus uh, more on the beneficiaries or the target groups who want to study or reach. Okay, thank you. Very interesting contributions, Nisi. I don't. I hope you, I, I pronounce your name name correctly. Perfectly fine. Thank you. <laughs> I think a gender dimension also includes there is the researcher aspect, and obviously behalf of the society we may call it the researched so i think we are responsible for defining the you know defining different subjectivities dimensions of subjectivities or those rich interactions between the researcher and the researched the subject matters and who is you know entering to that uh, particular space those all rich interactions in, in rich, uh, you know, heterogeneous way, you know, in rich crystallized uh, dimensions that we have to define our relationship, in my opinion, those give and takes. Yes, very interesting. I, I understand, I see from, you know, from your reactions, we don't have much time left, so I'm, maybe I'm going to try to close you now, but we have tomorrow to go, you know, I will invite you to to reflect on your own with what we learned today reflect on your own project and then tomorrow we'll take all the time to discuss that in, in larger depth but maybe as a summary you know to react to what you uh, uh, from my experience or your your very very um, meaningful remarks here the question of gender is indeed often reduced to the question of biological sex you know women and men women versus men whereas if you look at the you know what gender what gender is about it's about the valorization of the roles that are taken on by women and men you know the masculine roles or more valor, valorized than the feminine roles and that is throughout our economic system we are all about competition extraction um, and not about caring caring for the future generations has been really marginalized and traditionally, and also in a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, you look at the war, you know, the men are more in the competitive, uh, starker, stronger in the competitive roles, and we may need that for certain things, but it's like with antibiotics, if you have only competition, it's not going to be healthy. So you also need the caring and the balance between the two. That is where the gender comes in. And it could, you could have women that are very competitive, you know, think of Margaret Thatcher. I mean, she was not the very, you know, she was, she was very about competitive, etc. You can also have men that are very caring that are, you know, so it's not about individuals. It's not about individual sex. It's not about counting the, the numbers. And as you, as uh, was it Alessandra said, the caring is also about aging people, people with different backgrounds. You know, are we, are we, 
considering ourselves as the norm and them as the exception, that would be, you know, again, a patriarchal uh, relationship. So it's a constant reflection on the balance between what, you know, in China they call it yin and yang, you know, the, the being strong, being ascendant, being effective, having impact on the one hand, but questioning yourself and listening to the others and caring for the other dimensions, the one that you're, you know, you're excluded, that you're more powerful. And that is what we, the gender is about. So to go back to the, the example of the, of the, the, that was given about the, the women uh, groups in uh, India, I think there, you know, if it is framed, especially by the men, if it is framed as the women's right against their rights as men, you're entering into their masculine or, you know, competitive frame. And of course they will compete back. Okay. You know, because you're entering in the frame, you're saying this is the rights of women. And so what I've seen, for example, in a project in South Africa is when you ex include the men and say, what is our common goal? And what could be the contribution of the women to our common goal? And what, why do the, you know, what would have to change in the power that would, you know, the, the capacities that women have or the empowerment of the women? Then you make the men the, the co-owners. And you can also understand why, you know, very often there's research on that too. The men are, uh, are themselves in very patriarchal and, and dominant relationships. You know, they're being exploited by their boss or, uh, whatever, you know, and then to restore the balance, they have to dominate somebody within the family. You know, there's a lot of systemic analysis that explains that we have a, we have a very extractive and competitive money system. So if you look at it from, you know, from the gender balance and say, how can we help the men to become more caring for the common goal? And also, you know, counting on the women to, to contribute to that goal, you could get a different, a different framing and you could, you know, maybe take the next step. In South Africa, there was, a, a, I saw a man, a, it was a man who would, uh, there was a, a big celebration, it was a, a community, uh, just, uh, you know, a, a celebration in a school with kids. And he took the word and he said, you know, we men, we are stupid if we, if we don't stop beating our women and we should be more proud of ourselves and, we, you know, uh, Proud men don't beat their women. And so, you know, in involving the men that, and that was a really gender, you know, this man was talking about caring for women. So it's not about the sex, it's about the gender. And then uh, about the, let's see about the, what was said about how it uh, indeed it, it connects with ethics. Uh, I think that goes back to, you know, in, in the shallow approach to RRI, they will say uh, research ethics means that you are honest with your data. You know, you're not, um you're not cheating <laughs> you know which is very shallow you know for the rest you can you can you can develop the next atomic bomb uh, as long as you don't cheat with your data it's ethical you know, we don't, you know I think from the between societal needs you understand that ethics must mean something really you know diff uh, different and i think what it really is about uh, the, the the primary goal is and somebody said the, what is the common good what is you know ethics is what is good and bad you know what is the common good that we go we want to achieve and then we will deconstruct what keeps us from getting there and so what we need to innovate to to get there uh i think you know there is not one you know there is not one you know wise person or somebody who has a telephone line to god and say i know what the good is and now you just implement it it is you know the communities that that agree together mostly what is unacceptable what is injustice and therefore, you know, what we need to change in the world to have a better world. It's never going to be the ultimate good world because, you know, everything is an evolution and what is considered just today may be, uh, create new, you know, what is considered good today may create new problems in the future. But a lot of the time, you know, what I use is the, the sustainable development goals. You know, all the people in the world have agreed and I use them in a very critical way. I don't, I don't look at all the targets as they have been uh, identified because a lot of them are also you know superficial rri but if you look at you know we want a world where you know there's no you know the social the societal goals you know there's no hunger there's uh, education for everybody there's uh, gender equality there's good health uh, etc and we want to achieve those goals within a healthy planet with a stable climate life underwater and life on land that will mean that we will have to innovate how we live together how we how we 
organize our economics. You know, now it says economic growth. But of course, if we continue economic growth as we have organized it now, we're not going to solve the problems. We're going to, you know, exploit the planet. So for me, the SDGs as a global agenda, as an integral agenda, I often use a, a visual where it's presented as a puzzle. You know, it's not like the SDGs are the global puzzle and all the pieces have to connect together. You cannot say I only focus on SDG number eight, which is economic growth, and I don't care about life on land then you're not contributing to SDG 8, you know, it's so there again, you know, that would and that is one that I use, you know, we agreed on that. And then again, it means what does it mean in this context? And that is where you as researchers will have to make, you know, make the judgments. So I cannot give you the I cannot, you know, there's no expert that can say this is the right answer. But all we can do is give you the uh, the tools, if you like, or, the, you know, the, the framings that you can deconstruct or uh, criti you know, be critical towards your own assumptions and say, oh, maybe we should, you know, maybe we're still in power games. Somebody said uh, the relation between the researcher and the researched, that refers, I think I would say also to ethics and engagement. Are we still the researcher that treats other people as the object of research? Or uh, are we co-creating new knowledge? with each of us having complementary roles, having a piece of the puzzle. And uh, maybe as a, as a final story, I would like to just quickly tell you a story that I, uh, we did a research project with the NGO that I worked for, for a Brussels uh, govern, a regional government. And it was the Minister of Social, uh, Social Services. And he says, I know that in the Brussels region, uh, there's a lot of uh, single parent families from migrant backgrounds and they don't i don't see them in my services you know we have all sort of health services and social services and housing services and the with the single parent families with migrant backgrounds don't come to the services so there was a, a call for research to understand the the, the cultural practices of those migrant uh, groups so that the help you know the, the public services could be improved to help those people so my NGO, we, we got that call, we, 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 uh, we won the call, and we went to the, to the groups, we know where to find them, you know, they have their own associations and the social economy, and we said, we said, we reframed the question, we did not say, you have a problem, and the minister wants to understand how he can better solve your problem, we frame, reframed and we said, the minister has a problem, he does not understand, you know, how to help his citizens, could you please help us to, to to solve the problem of the minister. So we really put them in the role of the expert and we were learning from them. And that is how we really got very interesting results because they said the way your minister frames the problem, you know, is, is from the start is not how we define it. In our communities, we come from African communities, Latin American communities, uh, Asian communities, Eastern Asian communities. For us, if you have a problem, the, end, the, the, the solution is to have a group around you, a community around you, the clan, the family, whatever, so that the burden is shared over many shoulders. And here in the Western world, we're so individualistic, we single the, the person with the problem out and we say, you're the patient, you're the client, and we will find you and our help to you even better to solve your problem. So they say, you even put this bigger, you know, stigma on our head that we are the problem and that we need you to solve our problem. And we come from different cultural backgrounds where we are not the problem. We are part of the solution together with the group. So we told that to the minister and we said, the solution, the answer to your problem is in the city. Let those women, you know, they support each other. You have to support that. You have to encourage that. You have to reward them for, for it. And then the, you know, and he was so amazed, you know, he, you know, normally the minister opens the conference for a half hour and then he runs to more important agenda. This minister stayed the whole day and the next, you know, the next month they came back and they say, can you help us to develop a, a, a governance tool to stimulate the co-creation of solutions among, uh, you know, all, the, all these, these groups, these migrant groups. And secondly, they said from now on, all the research that is funded by the Brussels region has to be co-created. So that was where we had impact by redefining the groups as co-experts, you know, that is also the gender role, you know, we were not, we're not the masculine, you know, the, the dominant researchers and they are the object of research. We have a complex problem and together we can, 
you know, formulate the solution. And then, of course, you know, we had to help the women, you know, they, we would let them work on material. And they say, like, what would, you know, how, how would you do that in your community? And they would, you know, we gave them materials or visual materials because language is difficult. You know, it's not their mother tongue, etc. And they would make, for example, a baobab or a water well. And we say, like, we don't understand that. Can you please explain that to us? Why is a, a water well and a baobab connected to this problem? And they would say, well, the baobab is, for example, the place where we discuss our problems or where we supervise or make agreements, etc. So we could then put words on it and say, we, you know, we can't go to the minister and say, please plant the baobab. We have to translate that to concepts that the minister here can work with. So that was our contribution as researchers. But each time we ask the women, if we say the baobab means this, that and that, is that correct? Do you approve that? And say, oh, it's really helpful for us too that you put words on that because it helps us to also reflect on you know, the meaning of, of our cultural understanding. So we were really co-creating knowledge. And you know, of course, we, uh, it, it, it was, uh, we, we were engaging with the citizens. We were educating them. We were giving them new, new concepts to, to name their own experience. But we were also educating the minister. So education is about the society that is learning. It's not about we are the scientists and now we will you know, teach the, the lay person you know, about or do you, so you see what I mean? This is an example of how RRI really finds not only all the relationships around science and society and all the actors that co, co contribute to this you know, open access knowledge, you know, a, a knowledge that is open to everybody, but it also helps you to, to really understand a different, uh, a different, um, uh, the meaning of these six parameters in a, in a much more different, in a much more profound way. So this is, uh, I, I have a couple of minutes left if you have some closing remarks and otherwise I would just ask you to, to put down on paper after this session, all your remarks, your insights, your, your doubts, your critiques, and we can come back on it tomorrow. And for me, these six parameters, it's not, you know, this is the, you know, the truth about RRI is just that it is a very often used uh, model. And I want us to be able to, to critically use this model because it's, it's, you know, it's a bit canonized, if you like, but we should not just follow the, the canon blindly and superficially, we should understand what the deep meaning is. So if you agree, we can, uh, I will give the word, the word back to, to Raniero and we can maybe uh, see each other again tomorrow. So thank you, Anne, for this uh, extremely, let's say, interesting and engaging presentation. I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, all of our members have recognized uh, some of the approaches that they have already taken in the definition of their, their ties, the ways that the arrows have been working in what you have uh, 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 illustrated to us uh, because because as you know the the, the rice project uh, has been written on the basis of an RRI approach but probably not all of them including me uh, were familiar with uh, uh, with exactly what it means uh, to implement an RRI approach so uh, I think it was uh, uh, I think it was very useful uh, I myself have a number of examples that I could bring to what you have said. For instance, when you mentioned the the water well, uh, maybe tomorrow I will I will uh, I will uh, tell you a story about or a couple of stories about water wells. Uh, but now I think we should close. So thank you very much, and I remind uh, everybody that we are going to send a reminder uh, uh, later on this morning. But we have the second session tomorrow morning, starting at nine thirty. So thank you very much to everybody and uh, see you tomorrow. It was a great session for me as well. I've learned a lot. Thank you very much. And please, you know, start thinking of how it applies to your research and put it on the table tomorrow. Tomorrow you have an hour and a half to discuss with each other. Okay, how are we going to make sure that our project, the next text and our project will be RRI? Okay, tomorrow the floor is yours and I'm just stand by for you. Looking forward. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Have Thank a great you. day. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.